Welcome to the Encrypted Economy, where we look at the business of regulation and security for all things encrypted, digital assets, blockchain technology, privacy, and smart contracts. Hope you'll join us while we explore these forces that are shaping the economy. So this is Eric Hess with the Encrypted Economy, and I'm really excited to have Daniel Urube uh, and Christian uh, Rodriguez on the show. Daniel's with GenoBank, and they work closely with Somos on a very exciting project uh, that when I heard about, I'm like, I got to get these guys on the show, on the podcast, because it's a very real world application of, you know, basically NFTs uh, on some level and encryption all at the same time, but not for trading crypto. So uh, great story. So to lead off, I guess I'll start off with Christian. If you give us, uh, you know, so your background and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kick this thing off. Oh, by the way, sure. first of all, thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so Christian, why don't we kick it off with you? Sure. Thank you. And everybody that ever hears this message, saludos desde Mexico. It's a pleasure to be here sharing with you guys. I'm a medical doctor. My father's a medical doctor. My mother's a nurse. I was born in a office of, that was also a pharmacy. And it was a place where children were born all, every day. So medicine has always been near, or I have always been near medicine, but another component that it's very essential for me, it's technology. I've always liked technology since I was a kid. My father used to have in his office in a very early age, very old computer, but I used to spend a lot of time there. So that's my core, that's, that's my kernel. I am a medical doctor with the heart of an engineer and I am a translator or our interface between those worlds. Excellent. And maybe tell us a little bit about how you became, tell, tell us what Somos is and how you became associated with it and, and maybe that story. Sure. Among all my medical colleagues from my, my generation, only Federico, who is my co-founder, uh, chose a different story to what we were supposed to be doing as medical doctors. Uh, suddenly, I realized that he had changed. He was traveling. He was doing some project uh, while I was still trying to understand what I wanted to do with my life as a medical doctor. He was already building a company. He had already been granted by the National Council of Science and Technology uh, a grant. So, so he started research and development while he started his master's degree. So I got in contact with him and realized uh, he, had some, he was working in something very special. In that moment, I was working on an electronic health record that currently serves a state here in Mexico and has more than 100,000 patients. So uh, I started chatting with him, and we started discussing how we could start building this ecosystem, how eventually we would find each other and create something bigger. So while I was still in medical school, I started working with different companies. I got expertise in sales. So that's how I reached his first, first company. I started working with him in sales and doing some IT integrations in order to automate some processes. And that's how I, I, I started. I was not actually involved with the company. I was a sales guy with very interesting technology core. And eventually both projects got so big that uh, we were fortunate to participate in an acceleration program in Boston in 2019 with both projects. This electronic health record that already had this smart stethoscope, that was what we presented, and also SOMOS. But in that process, in that acceleration process, we realized that it was a bigger picture, that the ecosystem uh, had to do with something bigger than just ourselves. So we decided to create this joint venture in which now Somos has this core technology in order to not only do genomics for Latinos, but also do other layers or other multi-omic layers. So th that's how I became a co-founder in Somos. Eventually in Somos, in, in Boston, we decided to, to join both projects. And in the pandemic, we did this transition 
from being a Mexican company to do soft landing in the U.S. Great. Excellent. And Daniel, how about a little bit on your background and how uh, General Bank and Somos came together? Of course. No, thank you very much, Eric, first of all, for having us in your program. It's an honor to be here with your audience. And um, yes, uh, saludos desde Mexico también. So I believe I have some notifications coming on. Sorry about that. The story from Ginobank is also personal as the same or similar to Chris, but in a different way, because I was already like very focused on cybersecurity. My background is in electronics and telecommunications. Back in 2002, I, I be began my career in a, in a very dear company for me called Sun Microsystems. And Sun Microsystems was like the my, my school, right? I really learned uh, Unix systems there. I specialized in story, storage area networks. Back in those days, we were connecting uh, hard drives with fiber optics, and that was like the most uh, relevant thing happening, right, around the, the data. Uh, obviously, no, no cloud yet, and that was my background. Then fast forward 2015, I went to Singularity University, and I heard from the words, like literally from Peter Diamandis, about blockchain and Bitcoin. My mind was uh, blown out. I said, wow, this is the most significant advance in cybersecurity that I ever heard, right? Like literally using digital scarcity. And I, I started to digest a little bit because it, it took me a while to fully understand. Then I, I trained myself with Jimmy Song. Jimmy Song is one of the Bitcoin core developers. Actually, he only accepted Bitcoin as, as payment for his training course. But I literally programmed in his program part of the Bitcoin core in, in Python. I am a developer. I am a very slow one. Uh, I, I kind of understand, but I am very bad at coding, to be honest. Nevertheless, worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but again, it's like one of my, my passions is to, to decentralize uh, everything that is valuable for humans try to come back from this uh, internet 2.0, as we call it, which is the corporate internet as we are living. Everybody knows like 87% of the internet has to have with or Apple or Amazon or Google or Microsoft, you know, or, or any of the variants in the, in the Asia versions. But I mean, it, it should always be a, a citizen owned internet as, as much as we can. And I believe that is where Web.3 comes in. Again, 2017, my son was diagnosed with a rare disease. I knew almost nothing about uh, genomics, just knew my, my biological uh, knowledge from college, practically. From But again, as a parent, I realized that this was uh, very important for, for to diagnose my son. I realized uh, how important these data sets are being involved in the rare disease for the last three years. And um, yeah, just, just learn as much as we can. Uh, went to Germany to train myself in bioinformatics. I did a, an RNA-seq uh, training. I met amazing scientists, uh, males and females. I mean, all, all the amazing people, right? I mean, literally, we're trying to help giants in, in terms of, of research. And one of those, I believe personally in Mexico is, is Christian and Federico. They are really genuine in terms of what they are doing. And I believe uh, not Genobank, but blockchain, uh, which is literally the underlying technology that we are uh, promoting as the governance mechanism for genomic uh, information in a decentralized way. Yeah, that's how we met. We literally wanted to do the same. Uh, so we were overlapping because I was in the, in the very beginning of Genobank, I was not pitching, but including kind of an ancestry report. And I believe Federico and Christian were like trying to also include a part where the governance of the data was somehow involved with blockchain. So we, we decided just to, uh, I mean, it makes sense, totally, totally makes sense that we collaborate and we just uh, sat down one day and say, hey, why, why uh, overlap our efforts and let's just uh, focus on whatever we are most valuable or more, more useful 
And then the, the partnership was very natural, right? Uh, or I, uh, at least that I would say that. And then even a, a good friendship, I might say, also began. Because now Federico and Chris, uh, well, we just gather and have spent time together and, and dream about the next generation precision medicine based on variants that are relevant for the Mexican and Latin American populations and everything and privacy and, and NFTs for genomic information and so on. And here we are with you now. And thank you again for having us. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to, to continuing uh, talking to you gentlemen today. So Christian, if you could maybe just talk about the, the mission of Somos Ancestria and even maybe a personal event that sort of shaped your view of that mission. I believe that the, this inflection point and also this connection point where we meet Genobank and, and Daniel has to do with, as Daniel was mentioning, with mission, mission core or mission being mission driven. We both have this personal uh, story that relates to technology and how we could solve this ecosystem or these problems related to this ecosystem with technology. So we were thinking in 2017 about how we could do things different in genomics because we had tried in Mexico with three different approaches, three different companies, but we realized that there were some big barriers. Not only the purchase power from our country is very different, but also people does not know yet about how does it work. So eventually we decided to change and we started, it was not driven by the hype of the ICOs. That's what I, what it, that is what I'm trying to say. I it hope was not. really <laughs> driven. It was really driven by real life use case scenarios. And I was trying in my mind to translate this, but I am going to say it literally. We uh, got this obstacle with the centralizing powers. We have this concept of Scientificosaurios, which is a very old archaic scientist that has this perspective around genomics that is only data hoarding and that they have to control the information. The same for the internet that we are living right now and the social networks is what we are experimenting. And uh, we have the history one time opportunity to change it. And we are experimenting that with genomics, which is very delicate. So in 2017, we were discussing some ideas of how we could avoid these centralizing powers or take the powers out from them and give it back to the users or the patients. But we didn't know how, but Daniel maybe had this idea seen singularity, and I'm sure that mission driven, he continued working towards this solu solution until he had this Eureka moment. And the way he approaches it and solves it, I believe is, it's a game changer. So actually it was a recommendation from another entrepreneur from Mexico that it's working towards the centralizing fiduciary entities. It's, he is working towards the centralizing notarios. I don't know how to translate that in English, but it's also uh, the, public, the same. Public notaries. Yep. Yes, public notaries. Yeah. So uh, he's a friend of Daniel, and he mentioned him in a conversation I had with him, and he told me, "Why don't you speak with Daniel again?" And Federico had already met with Daniel. It might maybe wasn't the time, but in that moment we realized that we had advanced towards yes, a purpose-driven ecosystem in which we realize that it's not about us, it's not about even our team, it's about something bigger, because this figure I'm talking about, the Scientificosaurio, it's everywhere. Uh, we, we met someone that told us that there's a Scientificosaurio in Southeast Asia that hoards 300 million biosamples. That's a lot of power. Actually, that, that shouldn't be that way. Sorry to interrupt, Chris. Uh, the Scientificosaurio, maybe the correct translation or one, one of the alternatives could be Researchosaurus, right? So it's a combination of a dinosaur and a researcher, right? It's, <laughs> that's, that's the connotation of the, the expression that Chris is using. And yeah, we, we laugh and say, hey, this is a feudal kind of thinking, right? It's, it's a person that thinks they own the data sets, that they own genomics, 
in a very particular context, like ancestry for pre-Hispanic, uh, you know, references and everything. So uh, that's that's the way, and it's still today. I mean, I just had a conversation this morning with another researcher, a very young one, talented, and he's facing the same problem. It's just scientists that they are just lying in their back. Everybody has to ask for their permission in order to do something in Mexico. I don't know, but I am. I assume that that's the same problem all over Latin America and maybe the world, right? There is uh, people who thinks that their authority, which I don't, I mean, I am not anybody to not recognize that authority in genomics in terms of the research or the papers. But in terms of the governance of the data sets, I believe the last saying has to come from the donors, right? The real and gen genuine, genuine owners of the data. So that is really our mission-driven kind of glue between Somos and I. See, whatever we do, we both parties promise to always ask the donors, respecting also not to overwhelm them, right? Because that's the other kind of, of vector, right? You're not going to ask permission every day, you know, like, can I open now your vault? Right, because and so on and so forth. But it, it is obvious that privacy comes with control, and control means the interaction with the donor. But you don't want to overwhelm uh, now because everybody right now is is I believe super uh, fed up with the cookies kind of thing, right? With the allow cookies every time you visit a web browser is is like a crazy thing. Uh, but anyhow, we 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 want to learn from those kind of approaches and try to build together the best uh, possible experience that exactly resolves that thing about who has the last saying in the genomic data sets, right? Right. So, so part of the problem you're trying to solve is that the data is being controlled centrally, that maybe it's dampening some of the research that could be done on it and its utility, hard enough to get the information to where it's needed, probably as it is, particularly as you think sort of across Latin America, because... Uh, the genomic research that you're trying to collect is obviously, it's not just Mexican, you know, peoples, it's, you know, it's, it's Latino and also indigenous peoples too, which is something I know you're going to talk about, Chris, which, you know, was sort of like when we were, when we were having our discussion, you know, early, it really kind of blew my mind because it's not something that I really appreciated, you know, the, the unique genomic traits of the indigenous people and how that could be so valuable because it's, you know, I mean, it's a melting pot. It could be so helpful. And then I think one of you quoted to me, I'm going to, I'm going to steal your thunder on this, but one of you quoted, I'm not going to steal it. So one of you quoted me that 2% of worldwide genomic data is from Latinos. Actually, right? the, the update is 1%. The 1%. NIH update a few months ago is 1% for Latinos. Did yes. they burn the other 1%? <laughs> Before we jump into that, no, I diluted. would only was diluted. like to mention that it's all a matter of consensus and decision. And it's just this very subtle switch, but very important. Because right now, if Eric, you are a Facebook user or a WhatsApp user or an Instagram user, they are leveraging your data in order to do a lot of money and they are not sharing any money with you unless you have a Facebook page or a business and you monetize it somehow. But for the normal user, he or she does not have the power to choose. He cannot decide over their data. So that's happening the same for genomics. So we summarize our mission, I wanted to mention that, as uh, democratizing biobanking and precision medicine with collaborative science. And that collaborative science, it's our marketing way in order to not say decentralizing data, because we tried with some decision makers to present this project or technology at an earlier, earlier stage. But when you mentioned that you're gonna change the game, that you are gonna put this switch in order to give power to the user so that they can decide, very few like this approach. But that's the inflection and the meeting point where Somos and Genobank uh, came together in order to democratize this industry, in order to make it accessible to everybody. At least what we see right now for the next four years is, yeah, make it accessible or democratize it for Latinos. And, and do you think that lack of democratization is 
part of the reason why genomic data is only at 1%? Totally. Uh, I would say that it's a mix of problems. Purchase power, because when we had the opportunity to do research and development in Mexico, 20x Mexico from USA, it's a very complex thing for uh, an average Mexican to buy a genetic test. And even if they could, they are not aware of the benefits it could bring to them. So lack of information and lack of democratization, I would say. And also the other component, of course, how the game works. When someone is aware of how big companies are using their data, nobody would like to participate. Right. If I may add to Chris, there there is also the component of uh, genomic medicine or new drug development, right? It's based on on genomic information it's it's true and we we better say i mean that the funding for for the last 10 years in the genomic world in general comes from european investors right it's it's funded by european institutions investors whatsoever so it is obvious or well at least not obvious i don't know if obvious but it makes sense that they they just centered in those european populations right and they are tackling or trying to tackle diseases that, that are related to these European traits, right? The, 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 now the, the main idea is to empower people that is studying these genomic traits, that, but now that affects specifically Latino and Latina population, right? And that is, that is also what, I, what my point is there's lack of funding. There is just simply people not putting enough money into, into the Latin genomic world. And that, that is something that we w- would love to, to also collaborate in just to create awareness and this kind of project like Somos. They are already having a lot of uh, good investors uh, involved in, and this is core, core uh, researchers now putting attention into the Latino and Latina. And obviously Somos is a great ambassador to that. I mean, again, Chris, I'm just interrupting, but please don't stop mentioning about the indigenous because I believe that is, a, I also would like to, to love to, to hear it here with Eric. Yes, it's uh, a negative <clears throat> feedback loop. There is not enough information, not enough money, not enough purchase power, and not enough data. So if there's not enough data, there are no services. So part of how we change the game is creating the first Pan American decentralized biobank. And... It's this collaborative economy in which we are building the largest Pan American biobank and we do not own any biosample. That's, that's the magical thing about Genobank and the state of the art technology that gives this switch or it changes the game in this way. So part of, of how we give these new services to Latinos is creating this biobank. And how we do it is by creating through communication and through relationships with the communities, we literally go there and uh, to the mountains or whatever it takes and meet with the local authorities in order to first hear them and know what they think about it and maybe what they are expecting from us. And it's a process of creating real communication and real bridges in order to create trust. That's the biggest entry barrier for any foreign company that would like to come. And also this sovereign genomic law that exists, that a foreign company cannot come and take samples from these communities. So is this mix of communication and creating trust and hearing their needs. And with that in mind, and with their approval of the community and their leaders, we can start taking samples. And in that way, we can represent them in genomic databases. There are 70 communities, at least, that those are the statistics of the communities that are recognized because there are some com- communities that are not even recognized, not, not in history or in maps. So it's a very important thing that we are doing, starting with this approach from science and genomics. But, but this biobank, the centralized biobank, first in its way, it's our kernel. It's the way how we start building this unique data set that we do not own, and we create through relationships with those communities in order to, when we find solutions for precision medicine, we can give back to those communities. Not not, not only in uh, new drugs or treatments, but also 
we are trying to create this DAO, and we can discuss more about it, where communities can participate in collaborative science and also receive short, medium, and long-term benefits before even we can even find solutions in precision med- medicine. Right. So, in, and by DAO, you mean so the communities are able to, to vote and influence the project? Yes, and have a that's say? right. Consensus and decision and transparency. Excellent. And and the, so the revenue model for this is, I guess it's twofold. One is if you want to, if you want to participate and you want to have your uh, genomic information captured, right, in an NFT, there is a revenue model at the individual user level as well, right? Or am I incorrect? It could be. It's, it's up to, I mean, NFT in essence is programmable privacy, right? And that programmable privacy can be as Chris was saying, well, the, the short-term benefit is control, right? So you're gaining control and you're gaining the, the super feature, I would say, that no company will be able to establish ownership on your data set, right? Because the minute you act in this web 2.0 kind of companies, they make you sign an agreement with no royalties, worldwide, almost perpetual license that they will have, right? In this so, case, so, so if I'm having my genomic information incorporated into the NFT, right? So I, the, the, the the NFT actually no, it's not incorporating the NFT. The NFT is is the is the the traceability. But if I have my if my genomic information is being captured in through this method as a user, am I is there am I paying in order to have this record of my genomic information and compare or is the revenue model you know ultimately at the research side where companies are going to do research get the permissions from the users i'm sure i'm sure that the research is a component of the revenue model i'm just trying to understand if i thought that there's also a a user revenue model as well right Yes, again, we are, every, every use case is different. So there's companies like Somos that they, they eventually are planning to give a return of investment to the companies through the wallets, right? Because this capture term that you use, we, we use the term tokenizing, right? The tokenization, yep. right? But it's, it's the same. We, we understand that tokenization is kind of a serialization. It's a relationship between two parties and a data set. In this case, a genomic data set. What we really do with the NFT is we give an identity of this biosample in the blockchain context, right? The identity is paired to a wallet, right? And the wallet is owned and controlled by the donor, right? Uh, This is the general use case. The researcher gets a tokenized permission to use, right? This is the second NFT. It's a biosample permission token. And the researcher becomes a collector of these NFTs that is literally or hopefully seen as a license to use, right? So the researcher has a wallet and they collect these permissions to use the data. And it could be in exchange of simply a recognition token or a membership token, zero value in the market. It could be for cryptocurrencies, right? People will, or researchers can give Bitcoin, why not in return? They could give a native token, like for instance, Somos is thinking about having their own token, right? And be potentially traded after. So again, the possibilities are infinite or are not, maybe not infinite, but the possibilities now are in the, in the ground of the cryptocurrencies, right? In the crypto space. And now that is the universe, or as we call it now, the metaverse, right? That is being created. And it's literally a blue ocean, wherever you look at in the crypto art, healthcare, cryptocurrencies, new uh, economy models, and so on and so forth. But the one thing that I believe is the most exciting part is now you have a donor connected with a wallet, and that creates a very new and fascinating relationship between the researcher and the donor. And, and again, this wallet can be used to collect signatures, cryptographic signatures for authorization. It could be used to communicate, to use uh, encrypted text messages, very private, anonymous, maybe with a time bomb. It could be used to have tokenized consents. It could be used to exchange currencies or crypto, or crypto tokens that has economical value and so on and so forth, right? So literally it's, it's, a, it's a blue ocean, I would say. Okay. 
So, you know, we talked about reaching out to the specific communities and actually going to the mountains and meeting with community leaders. And actually, even before getting into countries, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of community leaders in gathering this information? Yes, uh, I was trying to put an example in my mind. And the uh, first that obviously comes is because it's very different to what we are used to experiment in our societies is they have different ways of representing themselves. Specifically for Baramuris, they have 16 governors. And I put this example because they were already using tokens before tokens were invented. Because how do they sign their consensus is with, how do you say, sellos, signatures, right? Or physical signatures that each of those governors has. And in order to approve a transaction, they have to have full approval. So they I'm going actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to actually stop you there because this is a great story that you're about to tell. Before we even get into the, the Ramirez, maybe just give us a little bit, because I think a lot of users won't necessarily know who the Ramirez are. If you could maybe just sort of introduce them as a people, because there's there's a lot to the story here, and I want to make sure we're, we're setting it up right. So do you want to kind of introduce who the Ramirez are? Sure. There's a lot, a lot to learn about them, wise people, wise nation, in the north of Mexico, in the mountains, up in the mountains. And they are famous because they are very physically fit. They, they are runners. They, they run, but they are amazing doing that. They can run days. We went there last year and we did some hiking in order to reach some points where they have uh, some problems that need to be addressed. It was complex reaching those points and they were just walking. They, it was another day for, for them. And yes, they are known because they participate in long distance careers run, run, uh, how do you say that, marathons. And they have amazing stamina and uh, abilities yeah, and performance. They have competed internationally and they always win. And what is amazing about them is where they live, it's, it's that territory, it's bigger than the Grand Canyon, but they run, they move in that territory just with their traditional sandals, you know? So they do not wear special equipment or 3D printed shoes. They wear just sandals and they always win in these marathons. So of course they, besides being wise and having a lot to teach us, they have some unique abilities or some unique uh, physical features that might be important for us in science. And this is a complex statement, and I don't want to be misunderstood. But the, the issue here is that we have very few information. So what makes important indigenous nations and Mexico is that we are one of the most admixed groups. But at the same time, those 70 indigenous nations have preserved their culture and genetic traits for centuries. So it's this very dynamic genetic pool that might be the right key for the solutions that we are expecting for precision medicine. Excellent. And so, so I, I sort of interrupted you in, in talking about the Ramirez and their they, that they already have a consensus mechanism. Oh, sure. Um, yes, they and, and they the importance the of the community. So sorry. Yes, they invented tokens in their way before blockchain uh, translated into the technology we are using now. But the way they create consensus is everyone in the community has to be heard and they do not take any decision without the 16 signatures. So, yeah, it's a physical token. It's a multi-factor authentication <laughs> decision consensus, consensus-based consensus mechanism. So... Yeah, actually, it's, it's more advanced than our democracy, at least in Mexico. You know, the systems we are using are very, could be easily dampened in order to, and I believe that they have in the past been, how to say, intervenidos in order to create favor for somebody. But this multi-factor authentication that they have, yeah, it's, it's, it might be uh, this initial point for the DAO that we want to create this mechanism of consensus, that it's another layer that blockchain creates, you know, because if we can create an analogy with the internet, there are a lot of layers and a lot of protocols. And of course, in the beginning, in this 
expected uh, inflated expectations part of the cycle. Nobody believed in the internet in the 90s, you know, and suddenly it became what we know right now. I believe we are right now in the same historic moment. In this hype cycle, we are about to reach this inflection point where we are about to see real solutions. We are already seeing them. We already have more than 3,000 samples that are in another different solution. They are not in this centralizing model. Those biosamples are now in the power of the users, which is amazing and is a primicia. How do you see primicia? Yeah, it's like, a, yeah, you are, a, you are a pioneer. I mean, you're, you're... We are. Yeah, well, we are. And thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like uh, being the, the world's first, you know, or something like that. I mean, it's, it's the, the prima. And so when you go to these communities, maybe the Ramory or, or other communities, and you explain to them what you're doing and, and how you envision collaborating with them, what, how are they receiving it? What kind of questions are they asking? What are they trying to I will understand? Continue, I will continue with the Raramuri example because they are amazing. <laughs> and you will be also amazed. They already know about it, everything, because it's something that has been happening through centuries in other industries. This colonialism that they are expecting from traditional companies, it just changed the name of the industry because a couple hundred years ago, some mining company, foreign mining company, would come to their territories and just steal their resources without giving back anything to them. So now that we are entering this digital era, we are uh, experimenting digital colonialism. You might think that they are not aware of this digital world or ecosystem, but do you have satellite internet in your house, Eric? Because the Ramuri governor has, and it's powered by solar cells, you know, and actually she had connection where, where I had no connection. So, and, and they, they use WhatsApp and they, some of them actually have a Facebook profile. So yeah, they are in the digital ecosystems. They are aware of it. Actually, last time we met them, the Raramuri governor asked us about the database. She, she literally used the word database. She asked who was going to be in control of that data and where it was going to be storage. Well, she was using herself, a smartphone. So yeah, they are aware of it and they are expecting someone to create a different ecosystem. They are experts in collaboration. Chris, as you go and reach out to other uh, communities, do you find that there is a similar receptivity? Do you find that in some cases the challenges are, are greater? Is, is it really just about educating and using even maybe the Ramori as an example? Every case, I would say, is different, and it all depends on each nation. Some of them might be more accessible towards these collaboration projects, and some of them historically have been a little bit more hermetic or a little bit more not into these kind of collaboration projects. But uh, I would say it's all a matter of creating communication bridges and trust and just being very clear just being very transparent about we are not the the experts, but we try to be very good listeners in order to really find out what are the needs of the communities and match those needs to the possible uh, research projects. So yeah, I would say it all depends on each community. Every community or, or nation is, is different, but as a common thing that uh, breaches this ecosystem, is trust and communication and transparency. So so when you're reaching out to, say, a community that maybe they, they are not like the Ramoris, they, they don't have the the satellite dish, you know, or maybe they, they aren't as technically savvy, when you get to things like the, the NFT or the DAO, I'm, I'm assuming you're not, you're certainly not mentioning that it's on Ethereum. <laughs> Because if they don't get the NFT, they're not going to get the DAO. How do you how do you frame it for somebody who just may may not have any real technical savvy? How do you frame the the value prop and what that technology brings to them that they may not otherwise have? This is a, a work in progress, but as we are uh, relying on exponential technologies, it's just a matter of time that the work in progress that we are doing 
matches the exponential point where it really becomes everywhere. Uh, for example, communication. Uh, SpaceX already has this application for Mexico in which for, I believe, less than $100, you can have your own satellite uh, node. And they are deploying this year. So it's just a matter of getting to the critical mass that it's needed to change things. It's just a matter of maybe hashtag in Twitter and reaching Elon Musk so that he deploys earlier. But smartphones are already ubiquitous, are already everywhere. So I envision, uh, at least from the Somos part, imagine you were bor born at uh, Raramuri and you are up there in the mountains, in this place that, that I told you that it's several times bigger than the Grand Canyon. Eventually, let's say in two years, you're going to have uh, Starlink connectivity in your smartphone. And all these problems that blockchains are experimenting right now might be overcome or we might have some solutions for interoperability for all these technical issues that this early stage of the web 3.0 has. But I see that it's just a matter of maybe two years that it, this, this is already available everywhere so that any indigenous nation in any place in Mexico could actually use our, our platform. So it would be just like a switch. Do you want to participate in this research project or would you like to share your information so that we can advance in precision medicine? And that's the part where the state-of-the-art technology by Genobank makes its magical move. It, that, that little switch, that thing of consensus, of asking you, of it's, it's everything, you know? It's the um, part of the whole process that makes uh, or preserves privacy, that boosts consensus, that gives the user or the participant the power. The governance mechanism is will will make irrelevant where the data is stored, but where the token is. I mean, who has the permission to use the data? And then as long as the data is available and linked to that token, you'll be able to reach it. Of course, it'll be a matter of broadband to see how, how quickly or how fast you will be able to access that data. But in 10 years, speed will not be a problem. Reliability of the network probably will not be a problem as well. Access to CPU and GPU power, we think it will not be a problem as well. Everything will be about data governance. That, that will be the specific topic. Who this data is, do you have the digital signature that approves you to use it, even to train an AI? People, I believe, will, will ask, was this AI trained with permission data or not? And everything has to be auditable. There's got to be a, yeah, a, a chain of custody and so on and so forth. So that's the way we picture the future. I mean, since inception in 2018, Uh, for me, it made sense to use the NFTs. That they, they were back in 2017. The only case was CryptoKitties, right? CryptoKitties had something magical for me because it came along with the idea of GenoBank and the CryptoKitties. Each of the of the you know the, this crypto art had a thing called the Catributes, right? And the Catributes is is literally the metadata of each of the of the cats. And it's stored in a smart contract called the ERC721. So for me, it was like storing the DNA. And actually, that's how they advertise themselves. It's, it's storing the DNA of each of the cats in a smart contract. So literally, the, the person who buys a crypto kitty is buying the smart contract that contains the instructions to build the cat and not the cat itself. Right. So that's why one of the main explanations is hey, if you copy the photograph of the cat, you're, you're not, literally not, not the owner because you don't, you don't own the instructions or the blueprints. And that inspires me, it inspired me a lot to say, hey, th that's the way it should work with humans. For me, it makes sense, right? So I went and started like, uh, following the, the GitHub mm -hmm. or the GitHub of the ERC721 code, And that's how I, I contacted William Entrican. He's the lead author of the ERC721. Now he's a dear friend. 
an advisor for Genobank. Back in those days, I, I contacted him and said, hey, I want to tokenize human DNA data. He didn't say, hey, you're crazy or whatever. He said, okay, let's analyze the use case. And you know, and William became a consultant, right, for us, an, an architect uh, consultant for, for Genobank. And we spent literally maybe 40 hours just studying all the cases, right? Permissions, ownership, data, metadata, and so on and so forth. And even not blockchain, right? They're saying, okay, we have to be open to say maybe blockchain will not aggregate value. So at the end of the day, the, the conclusion or for us was that it made sense, it made sense to design a biosample permission token or a DNA permission token. The important part here is that we modify the Solidity smart contract. This is a, va a variant of the ERC721 that does not transmit ownership, right? So this is very important for us. We believe that DNA should always uh, belong to the person. Well, actually, in nature, that's the way it is, but in its, in its digital form as well. Nobody should claim ownership on other one data, right? It's, it, it's inalienable. Right or in uh, ability, yes. Thank you, thank you to to the person. And the only dignify or di dignifying thing to happen is somebody to ask permission to use your data for a specific purpose. And people will decide if you are reputable enough, if it makes sense for them to share your data. So this is in essence a delegation token, as you were mentioning earlier. So that's why that's how the the first uh, bio NFT, as we call it, uh, was born. And uh, uh, William and I are the authors, and hopefully we contribute to a potential standard. Right? We don't know if this will become a thing. We 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 think yes. And uh, the the main idea or the main purpose of this NFT is first not to be fungible. I mean to dignify the DNA information because the other tokens are fungible which means you don't care what data set you're going to receive in the terms of, of the Bitcoin or certificate. But this one, obviously, because it's, the, it's DNA and we are an instance of humanity and we are very different from each other, thank God. So again, is it makes no sense for us to use, uh, I mean, to treat DNA as a merchandise, right? Or as a right. commodity. So- um, and I think, and I, yeah, and I think we talked a little bit about your stance against genetic exploitation, basically saying that in no instance, not even just in this project, but basically almost as your core value, right? You know, even taking it apart from privacy laws regarding personal information, which obviously genetic information is. But even apart from that, your view is that this should not be, you know, this shouldn't be exploited for commercial purposes. It's not going to prevent maybe somebody from trying to sell an NFT of their genetic information, but for what you're trying to accomplish, you know, you want it to be very clear to the entire community, which you're trying to build trust with, which Christian talked about, that in every case, you're going to be requesting permission, right? That it resides with the owners, that the right decisions are being made, and that it's not going to get away from them. Because I think we talked about it at the beginning, like how, you know, these big companies were like centralizing, right? Sort of centralizing this information. And, you know, once they had it, they would do what they needed to do on it. And it could be for the good of humanity. But from some level, you know, you're saying it is over at that point. And so this is sort of getting back to, you know, if I'm not sure about somebody having access to all this information about me and it makes me uncomfortable, well, that that's really all that matters. Whether or not, it's for the benefit of humanity or, or otherwise, it's sort of besides the point. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a decision that you've elected to allow your genetic information to be shared. And it's not like you've, if you haven't surrendered control, which could be a trust thing, having the ability or knowing that you have the ability to say, I want to be forgotten. I don't want these people to, to, you know, I don't want my genetic information to continue to perpetuate in places that I have no, no understanding of where it is. And it scares me. So um, I commend you for, for taking that, that sort of that approach. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, and one of these I mean, huge advantages of using the blockchain is that these permissions are public, right? You can use, the public, let's say, power, because you will be sending in a pseudo anonymous way, but still uh, you can you can prove the, the identity with, with your wallet, like saying, hey, I am sending a signal to Somos Biobank to remove my data. 
and Somos will be, I mean, we already have a mechanism where we can trace if some, if, if a token has been revoked or not. And then they will act on, on consequence and then just publicly say, we just erased the data of this particular uh, user, right? So again, it's super transparent, right? Not all the researchers are catching up, like saying, wait, wh- how, why, why, why should I, you know, be, su- I mean, this, this, uh, Exposed because again, the main the main objective is to increase the liquidity and availability of genomic data for research, and we already know that siloing it, like centralizing it, is not working anymore. Uh, companies are shrinking, literally. The two major companies, Twenty Three and Me and Ancestry DNA, are shrinking. They are not selling anymore because people now, after eight nine years of that use case have been educated now and most of the people when when I'm talking to them said oh my god you're going to laugh about me because I did 23 and me or ancestry dna and then my data is is away if I would know so there's a lot of people you know like uh you know like not saying hey I I precipitated it but I say no no worries because these nfts that we're creating hopefully will be, will empower us also to help you to trace back or to recover your the map, right? At least the map. Where is your data? Because at least in GDPR, you'll be able to ask any company if they have a copy of your information. Today is only your name or your social security number, driver's license, or some something like that. But hopefully, and this is a service where we're trying to build a product, hopefully we'll be able to ask about your SNPs, right? Uh, and the SNPs and, and for the listeners, what's a SNP? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so the the SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. is is literally a letter, depending on the on the X or Y allele. But at the end, of the day, it's, it's a base, right? It's a letter in your DNA, and we are working in tokenizing ninety six of them. Ninety six in terms of privacy is, I mean, in terms of genomic genomic data is is small. I mean, it's, it's really, really can tell very few things about uh, a person because usually like a company like 23andMe will uh, process 700,000, right? Mm-hmm. SNPs. So from those 700,000, you only need 50 matches to have the accuracy to say that that is, that is your sample. Only 50. Right. So the, yeah, so the SNPs doesn't go to what you're collecting. It goes to how you're validating all the different points of authentication. Exactly. It's a point. So it's like it. multi-factor authentication at fifty. Correct. So we use ninety-six just because there's there's a standard that comes from quality assurance. It's not. It's it's called a sample identification process from a company called Fluidime. They already have a chip, and it makes sense because when when you invest in in a sequencing, sequencing is still you know expensive. So only for six dollars, you you run or you genotype ninety six SNPs. Then you run the let's say the you you invest as, as a as a laboratory in the sequencing process, and then you go back and you compare with these ninety six just to avoid like mixing samples and everything. And then they, they have some SNPs of quality assurance and everything. But what I'm trying to tell you, I mean, this has already been done by big laboratories just to make sure that they they just have a quality assurance point, right? Right. Um, and you're building it into the NFT. Correct. Correct. That's an easy way to think. Sorry, uh, an easy way to think about it, or how I I like to think about it. It's it's a checksum function, right? You correlate a uh, hash in a table or in a yeah in a rainbow ta- rainbow table or in a dictionary of hashes, and you b- validate or authenticate that. But traceability is a game changer, also. Right now, you don't have any way to know where your data is in this Facebook conglomerate. And you were mentioning Ancestry and 23andMe. They are going to be acquired or they are already acquired. One by a SPAC, BG Acquisition Group from Richard Branson Group. And Ancestry has a story of being listed, then delisted, then acquired by private capital. And now they were sold to one of the most uh, or one of the biggest private equity conglomerates in the world, Blackstone. So yeah, you never know where's your data. You have no way to trace it. You don't know where it is, who has it, or what are they doing with that. Mm-hmm. It's like if we have the last time in history to avoid being a real life Black Mirror chapter. And yeah. 
by by saying this, I mean we we are not like attacking or saying those are evil companies. No, I mean that that was the way. I mean it was a step, right, in the in the direction. I believe those companies we owe this type of style. I mean they they literally teach people how to send a sample, a saliva sample through through mail. That was a big achievement, I would say. The problem is that, I mean, and then obviously they, they will hopefully become now a drug discovery company. That That's what makes sense for them, just to find one or two molecules and then everything will be justified, right? Because that's that's what you do with 10 million samples. You, you go and, and discover a new medicine based on those uh, data sets. And that makes sense. But again, now people is is aware of the decentralization. We have decentralization. It works. And uh, it hasn't worked very well for the Latino population, which is most critical. Exactly. So Blackstone and Branson, you know, good luck. You know, it's it's great. I mean, it, it, it's obviously a service, but by the same token, no pun intended, it hasn't really included the Latino community in a way that's going to be, I mean, 1%, who knows what the figure really is, but it's clear that it is infinitesimally small compared to, you know, the actual community. And when you, again, you think about all these indigenous groups, like all the uniqueness amongst them, like how these drug discoveries may not be as effective, you know, or there may be things within those groups that teach us things to help us elsewhere. So it's a, it's a rich population and it's being, you know, unfortunately neglected. So it's, you know, it's a different way of getting at the data. You know, the other thing you, you almost have to wonder is the old way of collecting this information just may not fly anymore. Exactly. Meaning, Right. We're now much more sensitive to privacy. This is personal information. We're past the day, the age of saying, you know, oh, yeah, just take my data. I'm, I'll, you, you, I'm, good. You, I'm sure you'll do. I'm sure you'll do good things with it. So, you know, let me know if the, actually, you know, just just take it. It's OK. You know, that's we're kind of past that. And it really you guys are, are, are like attacking this this new model of inclusion and trust and trying to build a case and, and make people aware, build awareness as to the value of it. So it's, it's you know, again, you, you, you look at, you think of that just paltry representation. It's so clear that something is really desperately needed to make sure that there's proper representation in the in Latino community. So before we got, when we got cut off, we did this whole unpackaging of the Somos box. So, so, so Christian showed us the box. It was fully wrapped up. But it's okay. The the plastic wrapper is gone. It wasn't that exciting. It was, you know, but so so Christian is now showing us what's in the box, what's in the kit. So it's it's easy to use. And I guess there's there's a Spanish version too, obviously. <laughs> is that the that's just the English version, I hope. Yes, in the in the activation page you can Correct. change between languages. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, the main idea of the kit, yeah, so that's that's a very important part. So that's where the innovation, we think, is. That uh, card is the... So Christian showing up an ID card. Correct. It has 12 space or spaces, each for one of the words that the, that the wallet, uh, it has a, it also a pen. <laughs> Christian showing the pen because you, if you don't get the pen, they may not know how to, may not know that they need to write something, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So during the activation process, the first thing is that it's, it's like a pre-NFT, right? So the QR code, those QR codes are specifically customized for Somos. So those are Somos QR codes or pre-NFTs. So the, the donor or the, or the subject or the customer scans the QR code using their smartphones or the, the, the phones. And when you, um, so it, it is it's, it's a magic link. Right as we call it, so it takes you to the Somos uh, onboarding process. The first thing you you do or you 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 see is a picture of the bile or the or the saliva sample. And the first thing that the customer needs to do is to verify that the the number, the serial number of the physical exactly the physical tube corresponds to the uh, digital version. Right. So this is very important because they are obviously linked. The second thing is they will go to the next page and they will see the consent, right? They, they literally have to go hopefully through the consent. So where Somos is describing what's going to happen with the, with the sample. I mean, this is very standard consent form. 
and they say for for how much that they are entitled to revoke the token and so on and so forth. They then the the wallet is created, right? In that part, the wallet comes with twelve words. These twelve words is very standard for every Ethereum blockchain based wallet, right? It's twelve words in English. You have the the, the card to write the, them in order. The order is very very important, and this is how ownership feels. What I mean is if you lose these 12 words, you lose the ability to recover or to go to your uh, individual data or secure room, right? So this is very important. And there's aspects where people has lost and we help and we just issue another uh, kit. I mean, we, we do not know who is the owner of those 12 words. But at the end of the day, this person would be in control of the biosample and what happens to the biosample. Later on, obviously, there is a there is a roadmap full of integrations with uh, electronic health records that you might also incorporate identity aspects. But identity is really challenging in terms of the blockchain because it's like uh, again linking a photograph or linking an email to these 12 words for us right now doesn't make sense. I mean, because it's it will break the identity or the, the anonymity kind of, of thing. You know, one thing I wanted to kind of focus on a little bit more was the, the community rollout of, of Somos and how, you know, some of your current experiences with the community, how you think it can apply as you think even maybe to broader Central America and Latin America? Uh, I believe it's an ecosystem game in which we have to find the right people as Daniel Ginobank and his team in order to first land this concept in the Latin American market in the US. And then maybe because of the uh, statistics, we have five uh, next countries. 80% of of all the indigenous groups in the continent are among five nations. So that would be our next stage in the road. But uh, right now, our main concern is how we change the game and how we democratize biobanking and precision medicine for more than 60 million Latinos in the US. That's so a big market. It, uh, yeah. Yes, 40, 40 million in Mexicans only in the US. So. MIT says that by the end of this year, we're going to have 100 million new Ancestry users. And if you extrapolate the percentage of Latin Americans or Mexicans, we are expecting around 13 to 15 million Latin American or Mexican Ancestry users by the end of this year. And we're going to have two ways of doing it. The way it has been done before, in which big corporatocracies own data or Maybe we can rely in cryptographic functions and in this idea of uh, Web 3.0, in which we have this blockchain-based privacy consensus-preserving ecosystem. Hardware died and then we came to know uh, software and then software became software as a service. But now we have not only software as a service, but uh, we have different services that correlate in platform as a service. And there are some cases only... Some, uh, for example, WeChat, but that's a very bad example, maybe because of the surveillance capitalism. But it's a whole world. They do everything there. And it's the connection between different parts of the puzzle, this ecosystem as a service. So I I envision that we are going to, we already provide the highest resolution ancestry test for Latinos, but that's just the, the starting point how we give value to our customers and how we change the game will be all the difference to give back the ownership to the user, creating this uh, largest Pan American biobank decentralized in which we do not own any sample. And and so you said 13 to, f- to 14 million or 13 to 15 million samples by the end of 2021? That's what MIT says. That's what they are expecting. To t- to not, for, not, for Somos, not for Somos alone, but you mean just overall, right? No, th- th- this year, uh, our goal is 10,000 users. Right. So we are already over 3,000. So we are on our way, completely organic with the right collaborations and key partnerships 
and right people and teams like Genobank. Got it. So, so I mean, what you're saying is it's a very large addressable market, and you have a a, a creative solution in a space that's clearly needing a creative solution. It was great talking to both of you. Um, I'm going to be following up, seeing how you guys are doing. I'm actually doing some work with Somos on something else, uh, you know, in the U.S. So uh, I'm all in. So gentlemen, thanks so much. You know, actually before, I'm not going to break without giving each of you an opportunity to say, where can people find you and learn more about what you're doing? Please, Dan, please, I'll, uh, I'll go with you first. Where, 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 if people want to find out more information about Dan or, or Gina Bank, where do they go? Of course. No, thank you very much. Please visit us in our webpage, ginobank.io. That's our webpage. Please send me an email. Uh, contact me, uh, daniel at ginobank.io. I am very vocal in LinkedIn. My profile is uh, literally Yuri Daniel. And uh, yeah, uh, please find me on Twitter as well. And uh, hopefully we can we can support each other th- th- there. Excellent. And, and Chris, how about... Uh... Where can people find you and, and learn more about Somos Ancestria? It's a good place. Sure. You can uh, find me and let's chat in LinkedIn at uh, Cristian Rodriguez. And you can find us in uh, SomosAncestria.com. And we will be releasing a discount code for a certain amount of people that hear this podcast. Oh, no, look maybe. at that. Excellent. Great. Yeah, well, we're we're not exactly at millions. You know, we're like you know nine hundred and ninety nine thousand per podcast. No, not really. But no. there's uh there's this quote that says that the right message repeated the with enough passion eventually will reach the right ears. So yeah, you can find us at somosancestria dot com. Check the the we are section. Excellent. Thanks so much.